for a full 12 months a year. The 28 teams of the National Football League prepare for one day in January. Super Bowl Sunday. Every phase of every team's operation is focused on a single goal, the World Championship of Professional Football. Over 1,200 men have performed in Super Bowls, a game that has become America's biggest one-day sporting event. One big play under America's microscope can follow a player for the rest of his life. The stakes are high and the rewards are great. The winning team is awarded the Vince Lombardi Trophy, named in honor of the man who won the first two Super Bowls. More than 500 million people worldwide watch the Super Bowl on television, waiting for someone to emerge as a folk hero. It is the hottest pressure cooker in American sport, and each Super Bowl has its share of heroes and memorable plays. The Super Bowls are stories of both success and failure. Each has its moments when some of the game's greatest players prove they are human after all. This is a story of the men who have stood on the summit of professional football. And each year, their footprints are blown away, clearing a path for other teams with other stars to make their way to the peak. After the leagues agreed to merge in the summer of 1966, one of the details to be worked out were the details, the site and so on for the championship game to be played between the two leagues. And we never knew what to call the game. My children each had a, a ball called a Super Ball, and my daughter was always talking about that ball. It was a highly concentrated rubber ball that you could bounce on concrete, and it would literally bounce over a house, very much like a golf ball would. And she was always talking about that Super Ball, and I think it was one of those spontaneous things. I just said, you know, the last game, the final game, the Super Bowl. On January 15th, 1967, the Kansas City Chiefs and Green Bay Packers met in the very first AFL-NFL championship game. Everybody in the Chiefs organization felt an awareness that we were representing the six-year history of the American Football League. We weren't just representing Kansas City or the Chiefs, we were representing the whole AFL. And I'm sure on the other side, the Packers felt the same way too for the NFL. But that first game was very significant because it was the only time that a team from the pure AFL played against the pure NFL. This was to be the only championship ever televised by two networks. Maybe that's why so many of Hollywood's most famous faces were out to see and be seen. Perhaps it's also why this was the only Super Bowl that did not sell out. Those who did attend saw the underdog Chiefs score twice in the first half to stay close to the favored Packers, 14-10. But Kansas City coach Hank Stram was still worried about pregame statements made by Chiefs cornerback Fred Williamson. If we had any psychological advantage going against the Packers in Super Bowl I, uh, we couldn't do any talking. We have to be quiet. And here's Fred expounding on what he was and what he was going to do to the Packers and how he was going to level them. The man known as the Hammer had boasted all week that he would come down on Green Bay receivers Carol Dale and Boyd Dowler. Stram quietly comes over to me and says, that kind of attitude we can't have here. You can't be that kind of braggadocio guy that uh, you're going to uh, alert the Packers that we're here. I'm thinking uh, they know we're here. 
If I tell you that Boyd Dial is not going to catch a pass, it's because I believe it. If I tell you Carol Dale is going to be spending half the game on his behind, it's because I believe it. As a matter of fact, the first fake Boyd Dial gave me, uh, they carried him off the field after that. He, he caught one pass, was slanting over the middle, and I said, this is just what I'm looking for. There's a guy 6'7", six, 6'8", six, coming across on a slant in on the hammer. And I hit him with everything that I had, and they took him off the field because the shoulder was no longer no normal. And now if they want to blame the loss of the game on me, they can blame it on this particular incident because of the fact that after that, Max McGee came in. And it takes him an hour and 25 minutes to run a 100-yard dash. He goes over on the other side of the field, and I look up, he's catching two slanting passes for two touchdowns. As damaging as the McGee scores were, it was Willie Wood's third quarter interception that devastated the Chiefs. And it is intercepted with the left on. That's Willie Wood who picks it off. He may go. And he was laying back waiting for that one. After Wood brought the ball deep into Kansas City territory, the legendary Packer sweep took center stage. Kansas City 14, to Jim Taylor on a power sweep, cutting back at the 10, Taylor is in for the touchdown. The route was on, but the Packers still had some unfinished business left with the hammer. Well, I had set myself up because I was the Pied Piper. The Green Bay Packers are going to get the hammer. Donnie Anderson came around, and his knee hit me right on the smack right here in the forehead, and I went down. And I was a little woozy. The hammer! The hammer. You know who got hurt? The hammer. The hammer! Oh. The female hammer. Hey, slap! The hammer got it! Really? I'm the clown of the football field now, because I'm, I'm out. They got the hammer. They said, come on, get up. And I refused to get up. I'm embarrassed. They came and they dragged me off the field and dumped me on the sidelines. When they dumped me, I jumped up and I waved at my fans to let them know I was all right. The Hammer was conscious enough to read the final score. Packers 35, Chiefs 10. An important victory for the NFL and Green Bay coach Vince Lombardi. Vince would bring his Titans back the following year to Miami's Orange Bowl for their second straight AFL-NFL championship. This time, the opposition was the Oakland Raiders, who simply could not stop this team of Green Bay legends. The Raiders did themselves no favors by committing a wide variety of foul-ups and blunders. The Silver and Black have played some of the best postseason games in football history, but this was certainly not one of them. Green Bay bolted to a 16-7 second quarter lead, with the key play coming on a 62-yard touchdown pass from game MVP Bart Starr to a now very healthy Boyd Dowler. But as the Packers went to the locker room at halftime, something besides simply the game's outcome weighed heavily on their minds. We had all been pretty aware of the fact that Coach Lombardi was thinking very, very seriously about retirement. And uh, while many of us cuss him or call him names or a number of things, it's something like you might do with your family. You can call your brother something, but don't let anybody else call him the same thing. This is the same way with Mr. Lombardi. We can cuss him, but don't let anybody else holler at him. And we all felt that this was going to be his last game. And uh, I, I said to the fellows, I said, look, we got 30 more minutes this year. I said, let's give it to the old man. Let's play the last 30 for the old man. That's about all I said. The message was heard loud and clear. Number 26, cornerback Herb Adderley keyed a second-half onslaught that buried the Raiders 33-14 and gave Lombardi a victory in the last game he ever coached for the Packers. The World Championship Award he earned now bears the name the Vince Lombardi Trophy in his memory. Super Bowl III provided the classic matchup of David and Goliath. The AFL underdog Jets versus the NFL seemingly unbeatable Colts. But you got to understand that the, that the whole NFL thing was riding on us. That these upstarts actually were going to play against us. And we were 15-1. and one. The only game we had lost was to the Cleveland Browns. We had just played Cleveland in Cleveland, had beaten them 34 to nothing for the NFL title, and now we were going to finish up as the greatest team in history. We never recognized the American Football League, never watched their games. I'd never seen Joe Namath throw a football until I, the warm-ups prior to that game. We didn't recognize them. That was just a semi-pro league that uh, if you couldn't make it in the NFL, that's where you went. Namath would be the central character of an incredible pre-game drama in Miami. Ironically, Joe's coach, Weeb Eubank, had gone to great lengths to avoid controversy. He wasn't entirely successful. Well, the thing that I thought happened in Super Bowl III, that Weeb handled it great. 
He took us down there three days early, uh, turned the players loose, no bed check. Then uh, we started our week preparation for the team, and he brought the wives in, they room with their wives. Well, there's one thing that we, Bank had drummed into our head. He says, whatever you do, don't open your mouth. Don't say anything that might incite these guys. Well, what does Namath do? He makes some remark that there were five quarterbacks in the AFL that were better than Earl Morrill. And, you know, we're all saying, Joe, we have to block these people. You don't. One fellow who took particular exception to Joe's criticism of Colt quarterback Morrill was Colt place kicker Lou Michaels. The scuffle at the bar between uh, Namath and uh, Michaels. Uh, Joe was saying how they were going to kick the uh, butts of the Colts, and uh, Lou Michaels said uh, not only were the Colts going to kick the uh, Jets' butts, but he would personally that night uh, do the same thing to Joe. And it ended up, uh, Joe being a smarter guy, uh, that he ended up buying a round of drinks, and everybody ended up uh, having a good time that night. But just when matters finally appeared to quiet down, Namath dropped his ultimate bombshell. He was at a uh, banquet and where they honored him, and, and, uh, and during a question and answer uh, uh, session where they asked him, uh, uh, what do you think uh, about the game? Who's going to win? He said, well, we'll win and I'll guarantee it. Well, I could have shot him because he upset everything that I had done. But as it turned out, I think it really helped us because we all felt that way, but none of us wanted to come out and say it. Well, Joe was really the leader of that team, and he just says, hey, I'll get up and say it. And he got up and blurted it out. And when Joe came out and said he guaranteed that the Jets were going to win, our people got angry. And I thought, boy, this is just what we need. We were practicing in Boca Raton, and I mean, we had quality football practices for that game. And Shula had to call off the dogs. We were beating each other to death. We were favored by 19 points in that game. Uh, it was not even supposed to be a game, and we went in there knowing that these guys couldn't beat us. On their best day and our worst, they couldn't beat us. Well, it turned out on our worst day and their best, they could beat us. It certainly was the worst day ever for NFL Player of the Year, Earl Morrill. All season, Morrill had quarterbacked the Colts brilliantly. But January 12, 1969, was to be his day of infamy. The Jets intercepted Morrill three times at the goal line, the most humiliating heist coming just before halftime. On a flea flicker play, Earl Morrill was the only man in the stadium who did not see a wide open Jimmy Orr. When Earl threw to a different receiver, it was the Jets' Dick Hudson who ended up with the ball. Not only wasn't Baltimore crushing New York, they were losing at halftime 7-0. The Jets built a 16-7 lead that could not be overcome, even by future Hall of Fame quarterback Johnny Unitas. The day instead belonged to the swaggering and outspoken Joe Namath. Namath had guaranteed victory earlier that week. Against the Colts, he backed up his flamboyant boasts. Namath on a handoff to Matt Snell. Snell at the five. Snell at the three. Snell touchdown. The clock has run out, and the ball game is over. There is the gun, and the Jets are champions of the football world. If Namath was the star of the Super Bowl free upset, the central character in Super Bowl IV between the Vikings and Chiefs was Kansas City coach Hank Stram. Come on, Lenny! Pump it in there, baby! Just keep matriculating the ball down the field, boys! Let's go there, baby! Push it all down! Stram prodded, encouraged, cajoled, and fired up the underdog Chiefs all game. Of course, having pro football's number one defense at his disposal didn't hurt matters either. The Viking offense had run roughshod through the NFL, yet the Chiefs held them to a paltry seven points. Although the play of the defense warmed Stram's heart, an occasional referee judgment elicited a cool rejoinder. Boy, that's a bad call. Mr. Official, let me ask you something. How can six of you miss a play like that, huh? All six of you. The ball jumped out of there as soon as we made contact. I thought you were talking about you being on the field. No. What? Hey, hey, we, go, we don't give them anything, man. We keep scoring that pressure on, putting the coal in the fire. Kicking a pie behind. Let's go. Come on. No frozen rope. Get it up in the air so we can cover this thing, all right? Let's go. Three field goals gave Kansas City a 9-0 lead. And then, 
a Minnesota mistake handed the Chiefs a golden opportunity. We got the ball, boys. Stram didn't hesitate, calling for his favorite goal line play. 65 toss power trap. Look for 65 toss power trap. What does it look like? Hey, look for our 65 toss power trap. Let's see what it looks like. Gloucester, tell him 65 toss power trap. Get in there for 65 toss power trap. Let's block. Let's Come on, let's, let's get seven points. Come on, let's go. 65 toss power trap. That might pop wide open rats. Come on, let's go. 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 Let's go.
and Miami became the only team in Super Bowl history not to score a touchdown. People had those white handkerchiefs waving before we came out. I think they're going to use it to dry their eyes now. Look at them. Dry your eyes and weep. <laughs> We're number one. Hey, let's get better now. We'll improve out here in the next couple of series. Let's go. And Greasy back to throw again. Somebody fell down. It's a pass intercepted by Halley down to the 40. Halley down to the 35. Halley down to the 20. Chuck falls down at the 10-yard line. And Halley is so bad. Here's one of the great original Cowboys. Garrison Wright, Thomas left, second to go. Pitch out to Thomas. Clean. Cuts inside the five to the five. And that's now for Wayne Thomas. He made a great move. 11.50 remaining. Dowdle's leading 17 to 3. And they're at the seven-yard line of Miami. Stomach drops back to pass. That's up. Pass to in. Throw. Touchdown! It's the Hammer, Mike Ditka. Mike Ditka. The Cowboys rushed for a Super Bowl record 252 yards, and their defense limited the Dolphins to a low of 185 total yards. What do you think, Coach? After 13 years as head coach in Dallas, Tom Landry reached the pinnacle of pro football as his Cowboys demolished the Dolphins 24 to 3. After that terrible defeat at the hands of the, of the Cowboys in the Super Bowl, that was the turning point in the Miami Dolphins from just a good football team to a championship team. The following July in training camp, Coach Shula said our objective is not to look back at what happened at the Super Bowl, but to now go forward and strive for perfection. And he said that boils down to taking a game at a time and winning every game. I don't know how many other people in that locker room or in that meeting room that day remember him saying that, but that was a forecast of what was he was actually predicting the future because we went undefeated that season. When the Dolphins reached the Super Bowl, they knew full well that 16 straight wins meant nothing without victory in the 17th. And it was a freak play that put Miami's streak in jeopardy. It is picked up by Garrow. He tries to throw a pass. Deflected in the air, grabbed by Bass. 40, 35, 30. He's going to score. 10, 5, touchdown. Damn! Gary, a premium situation. I think Garrow always pictured himself as uh, uh, Roman Gabriel in 6'6 uh, six, six and flowing hair, and standing amidst the masses and throwing the winning touchdown. Unfortunately, Garrow's. Uh, uh, <laughs> Garrow's dream didn't come true quite that way. In football, there's many tests, but I think Garrow Upremium passed the supreme test because had I been he at that moment, I would not have gone to the Dolphins' sideline. I've never seen Coach Shula look like that before or since. Garrow at that point was not a naturalized citizen. He was still waiting for his papers. And I think he had used Shula as a reference. <laughs> to be honest with you, if I would have been Garrow Upremium after that play, I would have run out at the end of the Coliseum and borrowed someone's car and drove to the coast and taken a boat back to Cyprus. <laughs> Fortunately, we won it, and I don't know of anyone that was happier in that locker room than Gary Upremium. He must have come around and shook hands uh, seven or eight times. <laughs> the world champions bubble refused to burst the following year when they took on the Minnesota Vikings in Super Bowl VIII. Winners of 31 of their last 33 games, the Dolphins pounded the opposition with the relentless running of Larry Zonka who rushed for a then Super Bowl record 145 yards and two touchdowns. Greasy turning around to check his running backs. Looks as though he's almost talking to Zanka. First and goal from the five. It's Zonka straight up the middle, and he's got the touchdown. Larry Zonka carries it in from five yards out. His second touchdown of the afternoon. Zonka was named most valuable player, and the Dolphins were proclaimed a dynasty. The Minnesota Vikings were the losingest team in Super Bowl history. And in 1975, they looked to turn the tide against the Pittsburgh Steelers. But if Super Bowl VIII seemed like a horror film starring Larry Zonka, its sequel, Super Bowl IX, featuring Franco Harris, was even worse for the Vikings. 
Number 32 turned Minnesota's purple people eaters red-faced. Behind playbook perfect blocking, Harris broke Zonka's record by amassing 158 yards rushing. Forty-two years of losing and frustration ended with a 16-6 Pittsburgh win. And no one was more fulfilled than the man they call the Chief, Steelers owner Art Rooney. The popular patriarch was a lovable loser no longer. Rooney and the Steelers sought to continue their winning ways against the Dallas Cowboys in what may have been the most exciting Super Bowl ever, Super Bowl X. From the beginning, the Cowboys made it look easy when Roger Staubach connected with Drew Pearson for a 29-yard score. It was the only touchdown the Steelers permitted in the first quarter of any game all year. But the Steelers recovered when Terry Bradshaw rolled right and found tight end Randy Grossman in the end zone. It appeared the Cowboys were loading their guns for a shootout. The Steelers accepted the challenge. They unleashed their most devastating weapon, a graceful gazelle named Lynn Swan. Swan's levitating leap is considered one of the greatest catches in football history. Then, he literally rose to the occasion to haul in the game's winning score. Now he fires for the ball, and Lynn Swan going for it. Swan pulls it in for a touchdown! Lynn Swan beat his man on the ball! Swan set a Super Bowl record with 161 yards on four receptions and captured MVP honors. For the Cinderella Cowboys, their storybook season came up four points short, 21-17. For the Steelers, Super Bowl X was another chapter to be carved into football history as they established themselves as one of the greatest teams of all time. From the Rose Bowl Stadium in Pasadena, California, it is Super Bowl XI. This is Bill King with a welcome. Everything in the United States, everything really in a sports sense in the world, is zeroed in, focused today, here in the canyon at Arroyo Seco. This 11th Super Bowl will be viewed in 41 nations around the world. Desde el Tazón de las Rosas en Pasadena, California, los Raiders de Oakland y Vikingos de Minnesota se enfrentan en el Super Tazón número 11. The Raiders, Ocean, champion de la Conférence Américaine, et les Vikings de Minnesota, champion de la Conférence Nationale. We are about to bring to you the 11th Super Sunday Super Bowl. Neither the Vikings nor the Raiders had ever won a Super Bowl. But from the start, it appeared Oakland, the NFL's most consistent winner for over a decade, would finally claim its first title. Raider quarterback Ken Stabler had no difficulty avoiding the jaws of the Purple People Leader defense. And his touchdown pass to tight end Dave Casper helped Oakland build a 16-0 first-half lead. Then, the vicious Raider defense choked the life out of the Minnesota offense. And in the final quarter, the Raiders' secondary turned the Vikings' comeback dream into a hopeless quest. Francis back to pass, throw the sideline, of picked off, it's going to be a touchdown, Willie Brown, 45, 40, 35, 30, 25, 20, old man Willie, he's going all the way. Willie Brown's 75-yard interception return for a touchdown iced the Raiders' 32-14 win and dealt Minnesota an agonizing fourth Super Bowl loss. The Raiders had never won a world championship. That was their albatross. But even that flew away with their convincing victory in Super Bowl XI. 
Though Super Bowl XII took place in the New Orleans Superdome, the stadium was filled with a fever called Broncomania. But while this game between Denver and Dallas would be fiercely fought, it would also be frighteningly flawed. Dabach flips to the left side, fires deep for Dupree in the 10. Billy Joe fumbles the ball. It is recovered down at the 15-yard line by the Broncos. The game set a Super Bowl record for turnovers. But the Cowboys shook off their mistakes and responded in spectacular fashion. by Johnson and Golden Richards gave Dallas a 27-10 win, evening its Super Bowl record at 2-2. Two two. Super Bowl XII lacked structure and style, but the intensity displayed by the Cowboys earned them a world championship. The Cowboys returned to the title game the following year, but this time their opponent was a Super Bowl veteran. The Pittsburgh Steelers were a big play team, and in the first quarter, they lived up to their billing. John Stallworth's touchdown gave the Steelers a 7-0 lead, but the Cowboys quickly proved that they could match big plays with anyone. Tony Hill, number 80, tied the score. Then, the doomsday defense made the Steelers' Superman-like offense resemble a bumbling Clark Kent. Linebacker Mike Hegman stole the ball from Bradshaw, and his touchdown return was a bitter pill for the Steelers to swallow. But it was just the tonic they needed. When Pittsburgh regained the ball, John Stallworth turned a routine sideline pass into a marathon 75-yard touchdown run that tied the game at 14. The Steelers were a mature, physically powerful team with a special confidence. When a title was on the line, they reached for the sky. Rocky Dwyer's touchdown gave the Steelers a 21-14 halftime lead. But late in the third quarter, Tom Landry's Cowboys were on the verge of tying the game once again. It's third down and three, Dallas at the Pittsburgh 10. Roger back to throw, has a man open in the end zone, caught, touchdown, drop! Dropped in the end zone, Jackie Smith all by himself. Oh, bless his heart, he's got to be the sickest man in America. Oh, Jackie was... Dallas's misfortune turned into a crucial scoring swing for Pittsburgh. The Steelers answered with a Franco Harris touchdown run. Then, with a Terry Bradshaw to Lynn Swan six-point masterpiece. Pittsburgh's 35-31 win put tears in the eyes of Texas. And in a contest that was everything a championship game is supposed to be, the Steelers earned their third Super Bowl crown. The Steelers and the Rams arrived at the Super Bowl from opposite directions. Pittsburgh was the defending champion, while Los Angeles had the worst record of any team to ever play in a Super Bowl. However, with nothing to lose and everything to gain, the Rams played with abandon and earned a three-point halftime lead. Football, the kick has the distance. It is caught! And the Rams are in front 13 to 10. Trailing at the half, Stoic Steeler coach Chuck Noll was surprisingly casual. He must have known. It was just a matter of time before his team took control. And he was right. He looks downfield, has time, cranks it, going long for Swan! He's got it! Swan, touchdown! The Steelers were still the same tough Steelers, but they soon discovered that their opponent was eager to wear the look of a Super Bowl champion. Call goes to McCutcheon, option pass, he throws downfield, leaping grab, touchdown, Ron Smith! 
Trailing in the final quarter, the Steelers made their move to rid themselves of the upstart Rams. He pulls it in at the 30, the 20, the 10, the 5, and it's a touchdown for Pitt. By day, the Rams' sparkling spirit had kept the game close. But by night, it faded into black reality. That first long pass to Stallworth had given the Steelers the lead. This one pointed the way to a 31-19 victory. He's done at the 25 and down at the 22. And now the Rams ready with their backs to the wall. Time running out. Harris flashes out the left side for a touchdown. Franco Harris. Super Bowl 14 took its shape from the team that lost, just as much as the team that won. Los Angeles earned a dignity in defeat that few teams achieve in victory. The Rams won respect, but the Pittsburgh Steelers won another world championship and became the first team to win four Super Bowls. Super Sunday, what a day. I can't believe it. It's like a dream come true. It's unbelievable. Yes, we're going to win. We are going to win, no question. Is upon us. Super Bowl 15 featured a striking contrast in opponents. The freewheeling, villainous Raiders versus the hard-working, disciplined Eagles. All right, double, double base pass, 46, 47, check with me. Time to throw. He's got a bag. Here's one. Intercepted. Oh, my. Oh, run. Oh, no. no. Back to pass, now goes Jaworski. Looking, being chased out of the pocket of the right. He's got running room, directing play, going deep. A bomb to the end zone. Harold Carmichael had jumped offside, and the penalty left the Eagles in a state of shock. They never recovered. Here comes the rush. Steps up. Can't find anybody yet. Tits off running to the left. Rolls on the move. And it's hot like this at the 40. It's over the 50. Here's the way. Raiders. Quarterback Jim Plunkett, the game's most valuable player, threw three touchdown passes. His third to Cliff Branch earned Oakland a win and their second Super Bowl title. Silver and black football is king of the hill in the National Football League. Good morning, 4 News Radio 95. In the city right now, the relative humidity is 66%. Southwesterly winds at 21, giving us a wind chill factor of 25 degrees below zero. A Super Bowl hat here. Both team hats here. High winds and very cold temperatures are the main factor to contend with. The wind chill index 25 to 35 below zero on strong winds. In one respect, Detroit Silver Dome was an appropriate site for the Bengals and 49ers to face off in Super Bowl 16. Both teams had come in from the cold to feel the warm glow of success after years of bitter disappointment. Cincinnati's veteran quarterback, Ken Anderson, however, met with disappointment inside the Dome early on. At the 49er eight-yard line, Eric Wright stripped Chris Collinsworth of the ball to snuff out a Bengal drive. San Francisco quickly marched 92 yards for a 14 to nothing lead. Here's Montana throwing toward the end zone, caught in the run by Cooper. He's got it. He's in the end zone. A field goal made it 17 to nothing. And like a smoldering fire, the Bengals could be smothered by another mistake or fanned to life by a touchdown. Anderson's five-yard scramble put the Bengals on the board and fired up a defense that held San Francisco's innovative attack to a total of four yards in the third quarter. Trailing 20 to 7, a 49 yard bomb from Anderson to Collinsworth put the Bengals in a position to score their second touchdown. 
three straight times from inside the five-yard line. The Bengals were turned away. And on fourth down, they called on short-yarded specialist Pete Johnson. Bengals on fourth down, has the ball, hands it off. He's hit at the goal line. I don't believe he got in. I don't believe he's in there. The 49ers have held and listen to the Niners crowd across the way. The 49ers have won it. Bill Walsh and his staff and a team that compounded pro football observers throughout the year. Beating the AFC champion Cincinnati Bengals in the Super Bowl. Notre Dame's Joe Montana earned MVP honors, and a year later, another Irish alumnus, Joe Theismann, hoped to duplicate that feat. We busted our We worked harder than anybody to get here. Nobody can beat us in a team, and it's worth 70000 big break! However, in the early going, center stage belonged to Miami's David Woodley. Makes the pass, coming to the near side. He's got Cephalo wide open. Big gainer. He's got a man beat to the 40, to the 30. He could be gone. It's a horse race. It's a Miami touchdown. 76-yard touchdown pass thrown by David Woodley, and they did something weird there that caught the defense with their pants down. 24-year-old Woodley was the youngest quarterback to start in a Super Bowl. But ultimately... A battle toughened old fullback named John Riggins would determine the game's outcome. Washington's front line had earned the nickname the Hogs, while Riggins was branded the Diesel. Big Bad John carried the skins to an early field goal. Then carried them once more towards a game-tying touchdown from Joe Theismann to Alvin Garrett. Lob into the end zone. Garrett's there. Touchdown, Washington Redskins. He got it. Redskins are going to tie this football game. Well, the killer bees, the killer bees have been stung. They have. Miami's killer bees had been stung. But seconds later, Washington was burned by Dolphin return man, Fulton Walker. Walker. He's got it at the 2, out to the 5, to the 10, comes to the near side, to the 20. He's out to the 25, turns it back. He's gone. 50-yard line, 40-yard line. He's gone. It's a touchdown. A 98-yard kickoff return for a touchdown for the Miami Dolphins. And as soon as the Redskins tie up, the Dolphins come back on top. Late in the third period, Washington added a field goal, and Joe Theismann turned in a terrific heads-up play by batting a tipped pass away from the arms of Kim Bokemper, denying him a sure touchdown. Theismann had saved the game. Now, Riggins and the Hogs would win it. For the second straight season, Washington earned the right to compete for the Lombardi Trophy, but ran smack into the Los Angeles Raiders. From the outset, the skins were outmatched, outmuscled, and outplayed. He's back. High snap. He goes up. Block. It's going to be blocked into the end zone. The Raiders on a chase. It'll be recovered in the end zone. It'll be... After Derek Jensen scored, reserve linebacker Jack Squirek faced off against Joe Theismann. With 12 seconds left in the half, Squirek made history. It's off to the left, he fires it off there, intercepted, Jack Squirek, touchdown Raiders! I don't believe it! Hey, Toledo! It was a silver and black Sunday from start to finish as Marcus Allen dazzled the nation and earned the title most valuable player. Block it giving to Allen, sending a wide left, he has to reverse his field, but he, and he gets away for a moment. Keep going.
dominating this team. Let's keep dominating. Keep dominating. We know that. That's right. Let's abuse Let's abuse them, For the Redskins, it was a defeat the dimensions of which no honor could be salvaged, as the Raiders routed them 38 to 9. A commitment to excellence is the motto of the Raiders. And once again, they fulfilled that commitment with their third world championship. Coach Tom Flores and the Raiders did not reach Super Bowl 19. Instead, it was Don Shula and his explosive Dolphins who would meet wise Bill Walsh and his potent 49ers in a showcase for rifle arm Dan Marino and crafty Joe Montana. Montana and halfback Carl Monroe combined for a quick score, but Marino and Dan Johnson answered for Miami. Working without a huddle, Marino fired Miami to a 10-7 lead. But in a record-setting scoring spree in the second quarter, the 49ers unleashed their versatile and varied attack in a hurricane of 21 unanswered points. Defense just cannot cope with the 49ers now. While Marino and the Dolphins sputtered, Montana and his Niners were running on all cylinders, as Miami's young linebackers simply couldn't cope with Bill Walsh's masterfully conceived game plan. Came to see an offense and the wrong one showed up. Dan Marino's year turned into Joe Montana's day as Walsh's 49ers were world champions for the second time, 38-16. On January 26th, millions across the globe hung over their TV sets and thousands of hungover Bourbon Streeters readied themselves for Super Bowl XX. The surprising New England Patriots and the mighty Chicago Bears squared off to determine who indeed was the NFL's best. The tone right now. You belong here. You're the best. Let's do it. The Bears led 13-3 after the first period, and they're punishing 46 defense. A unit that had shut out both the Giants and Rams in the playoffs began to dominate. Chicago's is a high-tech, sophisticated defensive scheme. And for the Patriots this day, the 46 simply blew them away. The swarming monsters of the Midway took it upon themselves to score one of their own, as number 48, Reggie Phillips, took a deflected pass in from 28 yards out. The Bears totaled three touchdowns in the third quarter, a Super Bowl record. With the last coming courtesy of the man everyone came to see, his immenseness, the refrigerator. William Perry's one-yard rumble gave Chicago an almost embarrassing advantage. It was only appropriate that the Bear defense logged the final points in Super Bowl XX, and a safety courtesy of Henry Waxter, provided the 46 to 10 final margin in a complete and total effort by the world champion Bears. When 1985 began, the Bears were on a mission, and in January of 1986, that mission was accomplished. George Hallis smiled down from heaven, ear to ear. His beloved family had won their first Super Bowl ever. Two sad notes, however, echoed after their impressive win. Walter Payton did not score a touchdown in the game. And soon after, defensive wizard Buddy Ryan would leave to take a head coaching job in Philadelphia. Nevertheless, Mike Ditka's Chicago Bears were indeed kings for a day. Hey, you wanted it, you worked for it, you earned it, and then you went on and took it. 
And God bless you. It's the greatest thing I've ever seen. I'm happy for every one of you. I love every one of you. The Denver Broncos came to Super Bowl XXI hoping they would win. The New York Giants came knowing they would. The Giants had bullied and beaten opponents all year. After dominating the regular season and playoffs, nothing would stop Bill Parcells' team on Super Sunday. New York took an early 7-3 lead. But easy victory disappeared on the vapor trails made by John Elway's right arm. Elway's one-man show played center stage in the giant end zone. Motion the right by Jackson. Elway's going to run in. But moments later, Elway found himself in the wrong end zone. The safety was worth more than two points as it marked Denver's demise and the beginning of giant superiority. In the first half, the Giants were characters in the story. In the second, they authored the script for Super Bowl XXI. Mark Bavaro's touchdown began an onslaught of giant points. McConkey comes in motion to the right-hand side. Pitch, Mars returns around back to Sims on the flea flicker. Sims is looking way down. In a dazzling performance that made history, game MVP Phil Simms picked Denver apart. The Giants scored 30 second-half points to set a Super Bowl record. Bill McConkie's touchdown was not the official end of Super Bowl XXI, but the official start of the victory celebration and the coronation of the New York Giants as champions of the world. The Tough Guy Giants. Blue collar champions. Boys at heart, but giants among men and the NFL's 21st Super Bowl champions. the great John Elway touched the ball, he set a record by triggering the quickest touchdown in Super Bowl history. With less than two minutes gone, it was 7-0. In Denver's second series, Elway set another record, as no other quarterback had ever caught a pass in a Super Bowl. After the first quarter, Elway and the other 44 led 10 to nothing. Washington prepared for the second. The quarter. The second quarter, to be specific. Fifteen minutes of madness for Denver, of might for Washington. A blur to the millions who watched. First and ten at the 20 yard line. High formation. Play action. Bank. Williams going up top. Got Sanders on the fly. Midfield. He's gone. Unless they can catch it. The 30, the 20, the 15, the 10. Touchdown. Washington Redskins. We're coming back. We're going to do it. Third down. Two yards to go. It's Monk. 
Goose in motion. Williams to pass, lobs it up. He's got Clark at the goal line. He's got it. Touchdown, Washington Redskins. First and ten at the 42. He'll hand off to Smith. And he back. Good haul. Midfield. Horse race to the 40. Far side, 35, 30, 25, 20, 15, 10, 5. Touchdown, Timmy Smith. Williams looks over that Bronco defense. Here he comes. Nope. Fake down everybody. Before the game, Doug Williams was asked how it felt to be the Super Bowl's first black quarterback. Afterwards, how it felt to be its most valuable player by firing four touchdown passes in the second quarter alone. Number 83, Ricky Sanders, caught two touchdown passes in that remarkable quarter. And his 193 receiving yards set yet another record. The Redskins scored five straight unanswered touchdowns in the most explosive quarter in Super Bowl history. At the heart of that attack was a previously anonymous running back named Timmy Smith, who ripped through gaping holes for 131 yards by halftime. By dominating one 15-minute period, the Washington Redskins became Super Bowl champions well before Chubby Checker's halftime medley. Denver's gimmicks, gadgets, the Duke and the Three Amigos were simply no match for Washington's size and strength. The Skins had backed their lighter opponent against the ropes and with mighty combinations spent the second half pounding John Elway. The only bit of drama remaining was Timmy Smith's pursuit of Marcus Allen's Super Bowl rushing mark. Smith's 204 yards set a new standard, and his second score mercifully ended Super Bowl 22. Snap, here comes Timmy Smith up the middle. Touchdown, Washington Redskins. For the second time in a decade, Washington claimed the Vince Lombardi trophy. The Redskins had blazed their war path and it had taken them down Glory Road to the World Championship. video is part of a complete blockbuster lineup of NFL films capturing pro football's greatest plays and biggest heroes with punches, follies, highlights, and Super Bowl hits, plus new releases each season. We've got action-packed videos of every superstar team in the NFL. Call 1-800-NFL-TAPE now for a free catalog and order your NFL hit today. Or look for NFL films at your nearby video store. The season's never over with NFL Films and Fox Hills Video.